Well, good morning. My name is Mark, and if I haven't met you because you're perhaps new uh, in church here, I look forward to meeting you perhaps after the service today. Collins Dictionary just announced this week its word of the year, and that word is permacrisis, permacrisis. And I must admit that when I first saw that word in a headline, uh, I thought it possibly referred to some kind of bad hair day. But that is not what a permacrisis is. It is apparently an extended period of instability and insecurity resulting from a series of catastrophic events. And probably after the last few years, all of us can connect in some way with this word. Perhaps you've arrived at church this afternoon feeling some measure of instability in your life. And our passage now looks at the ultimate fact of life which none of us can control, death. St. Paul says in the New Testament, he calls death the last enemy. Martha says in our passage about the decomposing body of her brother in the King James Version, he stinketh. The American writer Susan Sontag, who battled cancer three times, says death is the obscene mystery, the ultimate affront, the thing that we cannot control. And in that light, it would be easy to feel overwhelmed. But I want to speak this afternoon about how Jesus is a voice of confidence in a world of confusion, about how his towering voice comes against every other voice, external and internal in our lives, that would speak defeat. How the voice of Jesus speaks and commands with authority in every situation, including those ones where we feel out of control and including in the valley of the shadow of death. The voice of Jesus brings courage and hope. And the first thing we see in this passage is that in a world of confusion, we need a Jesus who speaks with authority into every trial that we face. A few days earlier, the sisters here, Martha and Mary, have sent a message to Jesus saying that their brother Lazarus is sick. And they're expecting, they're assuming that Jesus will come quickly. Scripture tells us that Jesus loves this family dearly. And St. John in his gospel uses the word friend about Lazarus here for the first time in that whole gospel. He also uses two words about Jesus' love for Lazarus, which indicates that it's both a sacrificial love, but it's also a deeply personal love. It's a friendship love. And yet, although Death is striking at Jesus' friends, although death is stalking even Jesus. Jesus delays coming. And as he arrives here, it's actually four days after Lazarus' death and burial. But this isn't callousness on his part. When he received the sister's message a few days earlier, he told his disciples, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And so each of the sisters come out now, and as they come, they see only in the natural. They lament that Jesus is coming too late, just as we so often do in our own lives. But in fact, Jesus is just walking to a different drummer to a different time scheme. Martha says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And later on, Mary's going to come out and she's going to say exactly the same words. It's like the two sisters have been repeating this line to each other. And this is the voice of the persecutor. This is the voice of the one who seeks to make us doubt. Isn't this the kind of inner voice that all of us know at times that seeks to shape our thinking and our mood? 
And yet Jesus' voice is going to speak differently into this context. And perhaps today you're feeling defeated about a situation at work or in your halls or your studies or in a relationship or in your health. Maybe you feel God has come too late. Maybe, frankly, you feel like he hasn't showed up at all. And your faith is being sorely tested. And an an eternal record is playing in your head. And it's going like this. If only. If only. It could have been different. Well, Jesus isn't troubled. He welcomes us to come to him with our confusion and our questions and our complaints. He listens patiently. When we feel crushed in spirit, he wants us to draw close to him. Because he's now going to speak words of ringing hope. When Martha says that she knows her brother Lazarus will be raised up at the general resurrection on the day of judgment, Jesus corrects her. And he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never never die. Will never die. Pope Francis has said the voice of God has a horizon. Whereas the voice of evil leads you to a wall. It backs you into a corner. And Jesus comes with his voice to liberate us from corners, and to point us towards new horizons. And what a horizon it is here. He's not talking about a general resurrection. He's saying to each one of you, you are going to be resurrected. That is what I offer you today. Through me, Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. So consider a case here. After a short illness, a mum dies way too young. What do her husband and her 10-year-old son and her 8-year-old daughter think about whether they're ever going to see her again? What do they think? The Christian knows that any believer that they've loved who has died will rise again. And they know that beyond their own death, in the words of Jesus, they will never die. In other words, they know that they're going to be reunited with their loved one. This is what Jesus comes to tell us here. When I was 23, the doorbell of our house rang one Sunday, and a woman stood there on the threshold facing me. And she said that my father, who was age 56, had just been found dead. He died of a heart aneurysm. He'd been riding a horse, and he'd had this aneurysm, and he'd fallen to the ground and died instantly. And I wasn't a Christian, and I felt out of control. Because I didn't know what I believed about what lay beyond death. In fact, I'd never had to actually face my own mortality. But it all changed that Sunday. And over the next few years, I spent quite a lot of time looking at different faiths and what they said about what lies beyond death. Uh, Every faith I could consider, uh, but not Christianity, because there was a kind of rebellious streak in me and I wasn't going near the church. And none of those faiths ever satisfied me fully with the answers that they gave until I heard the gospel preached and these ringing words of Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. And as a priest, when I enter into a church or a crematorium in front of a coffin to start a funeral service, these are the words I say. These are the words that priests have been saying in funeral services since 1549. I don't come in front of the coffin saying, I'm entering 
in front of the coffin in which our dear friend Tom, in which his body is slowly rotting because he's dead and gone. No, I enter proclaiming these thrilling words of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. And Jesus wants you to know his commanding authority this morning over every cell of life, whether alive or dead. In Jesus' book, no one and no thing is ever dead and buried. If you're feeling defeated this morning, Jesus comes to overrule your defeat. He wants to bring you courage and strength. So what a voice of confidence speaking into our confusion. And yet, Martha here doesn't fully understand them. She doesn't yet fully grasp the fullness of who Jesus is. And isn't that so often the way that our understanding lags behind that of Jesus? So she goes back to the house and she fetches her sister Mary, and Mary now comes out with various friends who are mourning with her. Martha, who is the more practical sister, has engaged Jesus in conversation. Mary, the more emotional sister, simply falls at his feet. We don't know whether in worship and devotion or whether because she's simply at a loss. But whatever, even though she's crushed in spirit, she still comes to him. And now we see that our passage also shows us that in a world of confusion, we need a Jesus who draws near us in compassion. We all respond differently to setbacks and loss. Mary here can only weep. And thank God for Mary. And thank God for what we see unfold next. Because sometimes it's hard to find total comfort in the future hope offered by Jesus' words, I am the resurrection and the life. Sometimes we're just caught in the numbing pain of the present moment. Maybe you've recently lost a loved one, or a relationship has imploded, or you've lost a job, or you've seen a cherished dream of yours die. Sometimes dying and death just stinks. It's as simple as that. Three weeks ago, my elderly mother contracted COVID. She felt sick. She felt sick at home. And um, she wasn't able to eat anything. She felt so ill, and she could hardly take fluids. And for four nights, my brothers and sister and I cared for her while in the day, end-of-life teams visited and district nurses came to, to check the injectables that they give to a dying person, and a hospital bed was brought and installed in her bedroom. And I confess, it wasn't I am the resurrection and the life that I heard ringing in my ears. I was on the floor with Mary to amend her words to Jesus here, Lord, If you had kept COVID from my mum, she would not be suffering. But I continue to come to Jesus, like Mary, and to bring him my prayers. And Mary shows us that sometimes our prayers can be very short. Sometimes our praying is in our groaning and our weeping. Sometimes that's the very best prayer of all, to bring to Jesus. What did I need at that time from Jesus? Exactly what we now see him give to Mary. We read next that Jesus is deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And the Greek words here suggest a state both of anger and distress. They suggest that his guts are literally churning over. And then St. John writes that, Amazing verse, the shortest verse in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. So with Martha, Jesus spoke with divine authority that commands. With Mary, he just groans 
and weeps and protests. Before his voice imparted courage and strength, now it registers protest and compassion. And Jesus' grief has many layers. Jesus weeps three times in the Bible. He weeps over Jerusalem, over its blindness. He weeps in Gethsemane, over the sin of the world. And he weeps here over the impact of sin, the effects of sin, which is death. He laments the weight of death, which bears down on God's people. He protests at the tyranny of death over our lives. And he weeps with Mary and her friends. He simply weeps. And this is the Jesus I needed to know when I was nursing my mum. There's a series of uh, psychology experiments that have been done by a psychologist called James Cohen, which really speak to this theme. And um, in this experiment, Cohen puts a person into a scanner. And when they see a red X on a screen in front of them, it means that they're, they're about to have a 20% chance of receiving an electric shock to their ankle. Don't you love the things that scientists get up to? So you're there looking at this red X, and Cohen tests the person in the scanner under three conditions, by themselves alone, and with their hand being held by either a stranger or a close, loving partner. And this is what he's found, that when they're alone, the areas of their brain that try to manage brain stress light up massively. When they're holding the hand of the stranger, there's a slight decrease in the brain stress. When they're holding the hand of the loved one, there is a significant fall and decrease in the areas managing stress. And then Cohen has found out one other thing as well, which is that if you wire up the brains of the people holding the hand, that scientists can't tell the difference between their brains and the brains of the person in the scanner who will actually receive the shock. Cohen says that at a deep brain level, it's as if the partner is saying to the person in the scanner, I'm here. I'm with you. And maybe you're experiencing some deep suffering or pain today. And what you don't need is some expert. What you need is a beloved friend. What you need is a Christian brother or sister. What you need is Jesus weeping with you in your pain and anguish, saying to you, my dear friend, my darling, I know you're suffering, and that's why I'm here with you now. Thankfully, after 14 days, um, my mum tested COVID negative and she's recovering. But as she's regaining strength, what a comfort it is to know that Jesus, the one who is love, is with us. And then thirdly, our passage shows us that when we experience confusion, we need a Jesus who acts, who acts to overturn every wrong doing. Jesus in our passage proclaims he is the resurrection and the life. And he also weeps. And this is important because resurrection without empathy would be astonishing but impersonal. Empathy without resurrection would be touching but ultimately powerless. It is the combination of both that Jesus brings to us. And so we see him now come to the mouth of the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus. Jesus comes fully divine and fully human. And as he asks for the stone to be rolled away, Martha has that line where she complains about the stench that is going to come out the cave. I'm fascinated by that. It's so human, isn't it? We experience some defeat or loss in our life that feels terminal and we don't want to revisit it. 
We don't want to go back to that grave. We don't want to confront that corpse. We're recoiling from the stench that might come out. And yet, we're seeing with human eyes. We're not seeing with the eyes of Jesus. And Jesus now prays aloud to the Father in front of everybody. And he's seeking to make one thing abundantly clear. He wants them to know that he is operating and has been operating throughout in perfect harmony with God. He moves at the perfect pace of the Father, not according to the voice that would say, he's too late. Late is a human metric. Jesus is never too late. His timing in your life is always perfect. And so he now speaks those great commanding words, Lazarus, come forth. And this is the voice that spoke creation into being and that can raise new life out of death. What happens next? Well, it's not written in the Bible, but this is how I see it. That when the stone is rolled away, everyone's there with their hands smothering their nose for fear of the stench. But then Jesus says that line, Lazarus, come forth. And there's a pause, and they wait. And gradually, they take their hands from their noses, and they smell. And surprise of surprises, there is no stench. In fact, the only smell coming out of the cave is of the sweet, embalming spices. And they and we now face the choice. Will we believe? Do we believe that Lazarus is going to come forth? Do we believe Jesus is the resurrection and the life? There's a line in the Shakespeare play where a character says, it is required you do awake your faith. And that's what Jesus says to each one of us here. It is required you do awake your faith. And as the people do here, Lazarus comes out of the tomb just wrapped in a sweet aroma. Jesus stands at the mouth of any tomb in your life today. Any tomb in your life. And he says, Yoram, Jenny, Mike, come forth. Come forth. Any area where you feel dead or trapped today, he commands, come forth. And he can free you from death instantly. Instantly. And this is what happens when people say yes also to Jesus for the first time. This is what we're seeing happening across our services at the moment. We're seeing people say yes to Jesus and instantly receiving new life. It's so thrilling. If you've never said yes to Jesus before, this is a great day to do it. And at the end, when we have a time of prayer ministry, I urge you to come forward and ask somebody on the team to pray a prayer with you, to lead you in a prayer where you can say your yes. So far, it's felt like there's a great weight of death hanging over this scene. But now, when Lazarus comes forth, we see that in the contest between Jesus and death, that there is no contest. Jesus is victorious. And in the lines just after the ones we heard read, it says, many put their faith in Jesus. Jesus was glorified. So we've come a long way from that internal voice telling us Jesus comes too late. Never judge love by any delay in his coming. Judge any delay you're facing in your life in the light of his love. Martha and Mary's faith was sorely tested, but Jesus' delay was in the interests of a greater good. 
And when he comes here and he does that miraculous sign, it shows us that in even the most apparently hopeless areas of our lives, he brings hope and he brings change. So take courage. Whatever adversity you currently face, here we see Jesus facing your ultimate adversary death. And we see death overcome and new life coming forth. This is the glory of Jesus Christ and this is the triumph of his love. Amen.